us life oh lord that's why there's nothing we could do is just to worship you this morning oh god worship the greatness of your majesty oh lord Your breath. 
you are so good now there is no one like you no one stands beside you and you know what church a lot of the times it's only until after our season of struggle is when we see God and where he was but I want to invite you that if you are in a season of struggle of pain whatever it is that you can ask God God help me see what you're doing right now and he might not give you the whole picture He might not give you exactly what you want to see, but I promise you that God is doing something, even if it doesn't feel like it, even if you don't see it, that in our situations, we can say, great are you, Lord, despite our feelings, despite our pain. And so, Father God, we just ask, God, you would give us heaven's perspective, God. Show us what you're doing, God. Show us that you are providing for us. Show us that you are providing an escape. God, provision that you are providing, healing God for whatever it is. And Father, we want to ask that you would give us faith to trust that you are good in every circumstance. And God, that we don't need to know it or to feel it, God, to say that you are good, that you are great. Because it's truth, whether we believe it or not, it's truth that you are good, that you are faithful. Father, we love you and we honor you thank you God that you are so faithful in every season may you just be lifted up God as we lift up our praise you lift our spirits up as well like David said why my soul are you downcast put your hope in God and so God we command our souls today put your hope in God we love you and we honor you we ask that you would be with us for the rest of this morning and throughout this week In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may all take a seat. All right, good good morning, IWC. Um, If morning. If any of you are new and you missed my announcement um, from earlier, we just want to encourage you to take a welcome card. Um, It just has some information at the front and the back. Um, and bring it to the front, and we have a a special gift for you for visiting us for the first time. All right, and so we have a few announcements. Um, For those of you watching or online or here or wherever you are around the world, if you want to be part of a life group, um, email us at uh, lifegroup at iwcenter.com. Sunday services are great. Um, We get to uh, gather um, together or online and worship with one another, but Real growth happens in smaller communities where you can be honest with one another. Because here, you could just be a face and, you know, walk in, walk out. Um, But we just want to encourage you to get um, connected with one another so that we can care for you and pray for you and know you by name. Um, Also, every first Wednesday of the month is a prayer meeting. So this month, that is April 6th. At 6.30, we believe that prayer moves mountains, that when we pray, heaven listens and things change. Um, So we invite you to that. Um, It'll also be live streamed on Facebook if you can't join us in person. You can comment your prayers um, in the comment section. Uh, We just love for you to be there. Um, We also have um, Easter that's coming up. Um, We have little invitations. Sorry, I didn't bring it up, but wait, maybe. Yes, I did. All right. They look like this. Um, And if you're here, you know when it is. It's on April 17th on Easter Sunday. But if you want to invite someone that you don't know, um, sorry, who doesn't know the church, um, you can bring this and give it to them. This has our information 
um, graves into gardens, Easter Sunday. Um, we also have a young adults youth camp coming up pretty soon. It is from June 10th to 12th. So if you know any young adults here, um, invite them, uh, encourage them to join if you know, they need money, uh, help them pay for it or something like that. Um, and we also have a youth camp coming up in this summer. Yeah, July 21st to 24th. We have a video, um, a short video to play for you. All right, so July 21 to 24th, if you have any questions, you can reach out to the office, to Ata Erica, or to me, um, and the fees are out, so um, the early bird fee is $285, and the regular fee is $310 starting on May 9th, the regular fee, so if you want to register early, you can save a few, um, some money. As well, we want to say thank you to everybody who's been supporting us as we support missions here and across the world, especially to those who gave um, for the Ukraine um, uh, ben uh, relief that we've been collecting for. And if you want to continue giving, we have three ways to give. You can give through our app, through Interact eTransfer, um, through our POS system here, and you can also give on our website. Um, and let's just pray as we uh, bless our giving. Father, we thank you for provision, and we thank you, God, that you are our source of all our needs. And Father, I pray that you would give us um, faith to give, um, whatever it is that you put on our hearts. Um, and Father, thank you that we can rest knowing that this money is going to your house, to your people, to benefit um, our community and the rest of the world, God. Um, Father, we just trust um, our funds and our tithes to you, and we ask, God, that you would um, be faithful with it as we are faithful with our giving. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> impressed by people who are driven by a worthy cause. I think last week we heard it from our amazing, wonderful speaker that uh, there are some particular personalities and characters that impresses us or impressed us. We've heard of Martin Luther King. We've heard of Mother Teresa. We have heard of Nelson Mandela. And we have heard of uh, the Ukraine president, Volodymyr Zelensky, and probably you have your own, um, you have your own person or um, somebody that you look, you look up to because of a life that personifies a, a person with a worthy cause, driven by a worthy cause. And so this morning we are going to continue on uh, our, 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 our topic entitled, What Compels You? And I would like us to go to Acts chapter 16, verse 1 to verse 3. Let me read. Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him, and Paul wanted to take him along on the journey. Let me start by asking you a question. Do you have a compelling cause? Do you have one? Something that you think is worthy to give your all? Something worth living for? Or even if there's an opportunity to die for? Something that motivates you to wake up every day, live life with a clear purpose and passion, that nothing can stop you in your holy pursuit. Do you have a comp compelling cause? 
similar to the compelling cause of the Apostle Paul. Why is it important to have one? Let me quote Dr. Margie Warrell, who is a best-selling author, international speaker on courage and leadership, and a media commentator. The power of purpose is similar to the energy of light focused through a magnifying glass. Diffuse light has little use, but when its energy is concentrated as through a magnifying glass, that same light can set to fire, set fire to paper. Focus its energy even more as with a laser beam, <clears throat> and it has the power to cut through steel. Likewise, a clear sense of purpose enables you to focus your efforts on what matters most, compelling you to take risks and push forward regardless of the odds or obstacles. This is something that's really very, very important. I, will, I would like you to look at this. It's for the sake of your mental health and my mental health. Unlike animals which are driven simply to survive, we human crave more from life than mere survival. Without an answer to the question, survival for what sake? Or for the sake of what? We can quickly fall into disillusionment, distraction, and a quiet sense of despair. End of quote. Without a compelling cause, we are living a life of mental, emotional, and even spiritual downward spiral. There's no sense of reasoning and hope for a future worth living for or pursuing. Last week, we learned what the compelling cause of the Apostle Paul was through our speaker named Mel Trinidad, which I am really much thankful and impressed because she is the right person to share that compelling cause, because she's not just, in theory, believer, a believer of the compelling cause of the Apostle Paul, but, was also, but is also a practitioner. And you know, Mel is not just an attendee. Uh, I would like to talk in detail about her involvement here, aside from being part of the council. She's also our HR consultant, being an HR uh, personnel in the government, which is actually a very busy job. And yet she has the time to meet with us, to help us, to counsel us, to consult us with a lot of the other issues that we are facing as a church because it's more than just having Bible studies and Sundays. We want to be in compliance to corporate uh, and even charity regulations, policies of the government. She's not just involved in the HR and even the count, a part of the council of the, uh, the, the church. She's also a life group leader to adults and to young adults. In fact, a lot of the young adults fondly call her Mama Melai. She is involved in the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the leadership of the church, but at the same time involved in mentoring people to become fully devoted Christ followers of Christ. And I know that she's also praying for people who are not yet saved to be saved. Her desire and passion is to see people come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so we have learned that last week from a person who personifies it, from the speaker that God has uh, called upon to speak in a very short period of time, given a notice just one day, and spoke from the heart. We have seen and heard what compelled the Apostle Paul, and that is to testify to the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? That is not the full mission and the full cause of the, Lord, of, of, of the Apostle Paul. In fact, that is only half of the full mission and cause of the Apostle Paul. But we can see and her we can see from the life of the apostle Paul how she how he was uh, he had this undying devotion. There was nothing that can stop him or prevent him from moving forward in the pursuit of this holy cause. He was warned by the Holy Spirit through many means and ways that if he goes to um, if he goes to um, uh, Jerusalem, then he will be arrested, possibly even killed after the arrest. And yet he said that he didn't count his life of great value and worth. The only thing that, he is, he is, that is important to him is his aim, his task, to testify to as many people as possible 
And I think it was actually very, very much an open door of the Lord, although he knew that there was going to be sufferings in the process. Persecution, hardship, arrest, and even martyrdom. It actually led him from the corners of regular streets to the corridors of power, all the way to the corridors of power of the Roman Empire. He spoke to kings and governors and to the emperor himself. Imagine that in a very short period of time, this man who had a laser-focused cause and vision and passion for it, he was able to fulfill what the early church was called to fulfill, to be a witness from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That's what is a compelling cause in a person. There is no wasted hour minute, seconds, day, or time, or even resources. It's all about the cause. But what is not spoken loudly is the other half of that cause, the other half of that mission. The whole cause, the complete purpose, the complete mission is not just to evangelize. The word evangel, evangel is good news. Evangelize means to proclaim the good news. That's just the first part. In fact, it's the introduction to the whole mission. The whole mission is what you call the Great Commission. It is not the great suggestion. It is not the great opinion of a great person. And it's up to you whether you like it or not. It's a great commission. It's a command to every believer. And that involves not just evangelism, but also to help believers follow Jesus Christ as well and live a life of mission, which is the Great Commission. It comes in full circle. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20 is the Great Commission. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, not just save them or preach the gospel for them to be saved, but make them disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now there are some people, some Christians who think that this is only for the disciples in the early church. Well, you know what? It's easy to see that this is beyond them. It transcends them. It's from generation to generation because at the end of the scripture that I just read, it says it's to the very end of the age. And if we are at the very end of the age, then it means it's from that time to our time. Another truth here that, share, that, ex, that explicitly shows to us that this is not just for the early church in the first century, but for us. Because it says here, if you're a believer in Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, go and make disciples of all nations, of all ethnicity, ethnos. Well, at that time, it was only the Jews. At that time, it was only the Jewish people who were recipients of the gospel and who got saved. And it eventually went to the other ethnicity called Samaria. The half Jew and the you know, other ethnicities. And then it went beyond Samaria. Where did it go? To the Greeks. To the Romans. All the way to the Roman Empire's seat of power. Now, is it in our time that all ethnicity is already evangelized and saved? Is it in our time that everybody is already evangelized, saved and ready for heaven, ready for the rapture, ready for the end, ready for death? No, not yet. According to statistics, there are 2 billion people who are considered to be Christians, but we all know that not all who consider themselves to be Christians are really eternally secure, saved by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the population is not just 2, mil 2 billion, it is 7 plus billion. So we're not even scratching the surface here. There's actually probably, let's say, let's, say, let's, uh, let's have a very, very liberal uh, estimate here. Let's say there's a half a billion Christian. 500 million. Imagine there's still 6.5 billion people who are all headed for a Christless eternity. 
So tell me, is this scripture rightfully also a great commission for Christians of our time? This was something that was heavy in the heart of the Apostle Paul. It was not just the evangelization of the known world, but also the discipleship. Now, the whole thing is discipleship, but we are, in, in our terminology, we, we kind of like make it twofold, make disciples, or discipleship is evangelism and the discipleship. We'll just say it in, in, so that it can be more clear to us that it is helping others follow Jesus or mentor others to follow Jesus. Evangelism, sharing the gospel to people, leading them to repentance and faith in Christ, and then the bigger part of the whole mission of Paul, which is the mission of the early church, and our mission is to help those who already believe to follow Jesus. Amen? In fact, that I think is really a big challenge for the church. Now, why is it important to know the compelling cause of Christ? Because you know what? As a Christ follower, it's very important to benchmark with somebody who followed Christ outstandingly. Now, have you heard of that statement? It's a business statement, benchmarking. Benchmarking is finding a, a standard of excellence and then following that standard. Let's say the gold standard of business and say Microsoft or let's say, any other company that is worthy to be emulated by other corporations and companies. That's benchmarking. Let's say I benchmark with Calvary Temple as far as pastoral leadership is concerned. After 25 years of being a senior pastor in Calvary Temple, you know, Bruce Martin has definitely led it to a significant growth and impact in our society and in our city. And I'm saddened by the, the, the news that he will be retiring come August. And I have known about it, but saddened by the fact that my good friend who has helped us in so many means and ways, in building, in helping provide us for the funds of this building, uh, of, this, of the building campaign when we were uh, um, raising funds for this property, and even while we're already here, he had supported us, helped us. He was truly the friend of pastors, a pastor to pastors. So I can benchmark in a sense that I will emulate the standard of leadership and pastoral leadership of Pastor Bruce Martin. That's benchmarking. People in business, courses and degree, you know what I'm talking about. So the Apostle Paul is somebody who is definitely a standard of Christian excellence. Now, of course, it's not that, oh, I'm not an apostle, I'm not a pastor. No, I'm not talking about the role. I'm talking about the clarity of vision, the clarity of cause, and the devotion and the commitment to that cause. It's something that can be across the board. From a regular Christian Joe or Joe Christian to an apostle. The good thing about it is that when God finds a willing heart, a devoted heart, somebody who is fully devoted to the Lordship of Christ and to the cause of Christ, you know what's going to happen? He's going to give you a path and He's going to empower each and every one of us in that assigned track. He's going to provide for an apostle. He's going to provide for a cell group leader. He's going to provide for a student at the University of Manitoba. He's going to provide the path and the empowerment for a person in the corporate world. In fact, you have more the advantage than us in the full-time ministry because you know what? Our very mission you're exposed to more than a pastor is exposed to or engaged with. And that is those who are still far from God, those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ yet. In fact, as your pastor, I would intentionally engage them by sports and really having you know, a, a, a significant relationship with people who are not part of my church because I see that my parish is not just IWC but the whole of Winnipeg and the whole of Canada. And so I find means and ways to connect. But you guys, you go there every day. You rub elbows with them every day. Uh, now, nowadays, it's just fist bump. You talk to them, you chat with them, you work with them. In fact, you more have the advantage 
when it comes to your proximity to the harvest field. You're actually right there in the pond, in the lake, in the rivers, and in the waters of the world. I'm farther beyond the shores. But you know what? I would still try to be closer to the water to fish. And so it's all about our hearts. Do we really want to be obedient and really be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? That is the question. This is not the great suggestion. This is the great commission. Now, you and I are born again. We're saved, right? Thank God. Because there was someone who intentionally and deliberately involved himself in the cause of Christ. And you cross paths with that pe- person or those people. Somebody prayed for you. Somebody even dared face you and confront you and say, this guy is very intellectual, this guy is very intelligent, this guy is very stubborn, but you know what? I need to share the gospel to this person. So help me God. I will not give up until he or she gets saved. And that's why you're here. (laughs) Because there was somebody who pursued the cause, which is called the Great Commission, to make disciples, to evangelize and help others grow in their walk and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What matters is our willingness and commitment, and the rest belongs to God. Because you know what he says in the scripture? That he is the one who is going to provide the power. That's what the Holy Spirit is here for. He's called the parakletos, the helper. Oh, I stutter. Oh, I'm, I'm an introvert. Oh, you know what? I don't know what to, where to start. Then pray, Holy Spirit, guide me. And you know what? God, God will whisper. Oh, pray for your neighbor. Oh, I'll start with prayer, Lord. Okay, Lord, I pray for Joe, my neighbor. And then the next thing you know it, there's a thought in your mind while you were actually raking your, your lawn. Oh, they're out for a week. Rake their lawn. <laughs> or cut their grass. Next thing you know it, they come back, they would say thank you to you. They would find a way to reach out to you, knock at the door and say, oh, thank you. Thank you for doing that. A thought would come. Invite him and his wife for coffee. That's the Holy Spirit's part. That is not your part to know the ways of God, to know the leading of the Lord. All that He requires is the willingness to say the Great Commission is not the Great Suggestion. It is a commission. It's a command. It's my mission. And you know what's actually very interesting with the life of the Apostle Paul? He was the great enemy of the way. He was the great persecutor, the torturer, and murderer of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the moment he encountered the Lord, oh my goodness, it was totally 180 degree turn. He was the greatest example of what it is to live a life whose compelling cause is the Great Commission. It was not something that he just lived for. It was something he died for. You know, I'm not really into politics uh, as far as being a pastor is concerned. I should not be having, you know, my personal political color exposed or shared because, you know, that's a very polarizing topic. But, you know, there is a Filipino political personality who said the Filipinos are worth dying for. To the Apostle Paul, Jesus and the Great Commission. That's what's worth dying for. It's not just worth living for. It is worth dying for. But we're going to study right now in the life of the Apostle Paul how he also did discipleship. How he also did, sorry, let me say it this way, help believers grow in their journey of faith into Christ-likeness and serving Christ by also pursuing the Great Commission. I would like us to go to Acts chapter 20, verse 4. Acts chapter 20, verse 4. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus, 
and Secundus of Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. My friends, these are biblical names. Why are we not naming our babies these kinds of names? Tychicus. Hi, Brother Tichi. Hey, Brother Trophy. <laughs> So what, 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 what did the scripture say to us? He did not minister alone. He did not his mission by himself. He brought companions and he discipled or mentored these companions. In fact, in places where he planted the cross of Christ, in places where he established churches, he brought one from, I believe, each, as we can see, somebody from Berea, of course, Timothy from our main text. Okay? Timothy from Lystra. He brought them with him. It was intentionally discipling individuals similar to the pattern and the model of Christ, our Lord and Master. Jesus preached to thousands. Paul preached to hundreds and thousands. But he discipled a handful. You can see that here. And so this is one principle that God has given to me, of course, through scriptures and other wise leaders in the body of Christ. Do not minister alone. And so that's why we have internship. And that's why when I do weddings, I bring somebody else with me or any other things that I can actually bring a person with. I would bring somebody who's I, who I consider to be a potential future leader in the church. It's intentional. This is the model that the Apostle Paul showed to us what discipleship or what helping others follow Jesus Christ look like. Bring people with you. Do not minister alone. And that is the reason why we can see here that this is not even just a one-time thing. It was a long-term relationship. In fact, when the Apostle Paul couldn't bring people with them or had the liberty to be with other people that he wants to be with, then he wrote epistles or letters. In fact, in particular, we have that name after Timothy, First and Second Timothy. Another aspect of that discipleship, that mentoring, is what? Writing letters to individuals, Titus, Philemon. You can see that individual connection of that disciple-making. Another scripture I would like us to go is in Acts chapter 14, verse 21 to 23. Another strategic discipleship strat or, uh, uh, strategy that he did. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, so take note, they preached, which is evangelism. Evangelism or evangelize means gospel proclaim. Proclaim the gospel. That's what they did, right? And they returned. To Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying we must go through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. And so when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commanded them to the Lord in whom they had believed. What did he do other than personally mentoring disciples? A handful. He did not leave believers in every city to grow on their own. He intentionally proactively structured place systems and leadership called elders, bishops, or shepherds to be the ones who will implement the growth and the launching of these disciples to the mission field. So did, did, do you see this? Have you seen this when you're reading the book of Acts? Sometimes we're just focused on what is on the surface, preaching, 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 gospel, gospel, evangelism. That's already something that's very daunting to a lot of us. But you know what? Thank God for the Holy Spirit because you know what? By His grace and guidance, we can win people to Christ. That's God's will. And so He will help us. But the other part is intentionally parenting spiritual babies. Parenting spiritual kids. Now, how many of you here, you're, you're a parent or your parents, and your kids you have raised into adulthood? Raise up your hand. Adulthood. You know the goal of parenting is to raise up responsible adults, not dependent adults, still babies at 47. 
<laughs> That's not good for them. Even nature shows, shows, shows us that there is a time to get rid of the cottons that actually make the nest soft and then expose the, the, the thorns actually. In very intentional. You know, the, the eagles are actually very intentional. Beneath that soft cushion are actually thorny branches. Because when it's time for those eaglets to start flying, Mama Eagle removes those cushions and then you see those eaglets, you know, being uncomfortable. And you know what happens? If they don't still jump because of that thorny nest, then Mama Eagle will pick them up with his claws or her claws and then drop them from that peak of a mountain. <laughs> and you might say, that's, that's mean! Mom, you're mean. You want me to move? Yeah, you're done. You're, you graduated uh, high, uh, college already. To, you know, the, main, uh, the other Canadians, it's 18. <laughs> My son-in-law left at the age of 18. <laughs> he and his siblings. You see, you might find it like, oh, that's me. No, that's not. You don't love me. But even nature itself instinctively know that parenting, it's all about raising up responsible next generation. Responsible for themselves and responsible for the next generation. And how do you know that, Pastor? I, 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 I love watching a lot of those nature stuff by David Attenborough, especially when it has this British accent. <laughs> BBC. And so, Paul was very intentional. Paul was very strategic. Aside from a handful of disciples that he brought with him, he didn't minister alone. He also did not leave churches to grow on their own. He established a system of discipleship. And then, when he couldn't, he couldn't visit these churches anymore. In their cities, like Corinth and Ephesus, and all other places he established churches, he wrote epistles. Continue discipleship. Continue guiding them through uncharted waters of theology, of doctrinal issues, of relational issues, of unforgiveness. Because he was actually, what, discipling non-Jewish people whose morals and values in upbringings were totally different from the godly Israelites. And so he took it upon himself to disciple, to teach, to correct, to rebuke, to guide, to establish a system of discipleship. Because you know what? Discipleship is best in the context of relationship called fellowship. And that is why I, as your pastor, similar to what Paul had as an understanding of discipleship, that we together with the leadership saw it fit to establish a discipleship structure called small groups or cell groups. There's a plenary session like this, preaching to hundreds, preaching to a big crowd, but we, we are best growing and maturing in the context of a small unit called family and small groups in church. And that's what Paul did. That's what Paul did. He established, he didn't just preach. The early church didn't just preach the gospel to unbelievers. They also established a missional community of believers. It's not just grow, 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 and then still stay there until the dying days of the parents. No. Grow, grow, grow. Be responsible. Responsible and adult, and then raise up your own family. The church in the early church was a missional community. It was not just grow, grow, grow. It was also go, go, go. <laughs> that is actually a, a, a sign of a true Christian maturity. Now, let us shift gears here for a moment so that we can actually define what discipleship is so that we can have a clear understanding of what is expected of us by the one who gave the Great Commission. Something that we should actually really take into heart and say that has been commanded to us. It is what has been commissioned to us to do. Then I should know it clearly. Define it. So I know what is expected of me. Because you know, one day I'm going to face the Lord. Not 
face him based on whether I'll be saved or not. I'm already saved. I know that by the blood of Jesus Christ, by his atoning sacrifice on the cross. That's the gospel. He paid the debt I cannot owe, and his resurrection is the proof. It is a successful sacrifice. So whoever repents of their sinful lifestyle and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. That's the gospel. That's what we need to preach. That's what we need to share. But you know that one day we're also going to be facing Jesus. It is actually what you call after the rapture of the church. When Jesus comes back, he will be in the clouds to bring with him the church, the Christians, both dead and alive. The dead Christians will be re reunited with their decomposed bodies. And then afterwards, we will be transformed into a heavenly, glorious body, and we shall be with the Lord forever and ever. Right after that is what you call the judgment seat of Christ, called the Bema, or Bema, or Bema judgment. Depends where you're from, how you pronounce that, of course. It's mean, it, it is the judgment of rewards and missed rewards. It's based on our works of obedience or works that God actually didn't want from us. Or probably, it, on the surface, it's a religious work. It could be evangelism. It could be making disciples. But we have done it with an ulterior motive of self-glory. And so we lose that reward. Because the Apostle Paul said that one day, our works will either be wood, hay, or gold, or silver that will stand the test of fire meaning the scrutiny <laughs> are giving an account to the one who saw everything and bring us his righteous and holy judgment. And so there's something expected of us. That's why we need to define discipleship and see, am I in it? Am I part of it? If not, then do something about it. Let's make some adjustment. Number one, discipleship is to call a, a call to follow Jesus, not just believe, Follow him. He's going there, you follow him. This is what he did, this is what we need to do. To call to follow Jesus and fish for people and help others follow Jesus as well in the context of what you call fellowship. Follow Jesus. I'm a follower of Jesus, not just a believer. Believer is just the entry point and then following is the next step. That's why I need to grow in my following. Believing, following, and then what? Going. Okay? Fishing. Fishing for people and help others. Probably the, the men and women you have fished or help, led, help lead to Christ. Be a part of the growth of that person. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, the scripture for this is, uh, is Jesus saying to his about to be disciples, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. This is actually very clear. This is discipleship. This is fellowship. I came here to fish for people. You want to be my follower? Follow me and fish with me. Simple as that. It does not uh, exclude people who are not pastors. <laughs> it includes all believers and so-called followers. Is this clear? Okay, follow me, and then I'll send you. True disciples of Christ are involved in consistent growing into Christ-likeness with other believers and also working together to lead people to Christ and make disciples. That is what true Christianity is. That is what true discipleship is. From the International Review of Mission, Worldwide Council of Churches, let me quote, a disciple has been shown to be someone who follows the teachings, life, and aim of another until the person becomes like that master. Discipleship in the Christian sense is the process of making someone become like Christ. It's a process of learning the teachings, learning the life, and applying those teachings and the life, or it means character and... and, and, and um, the lifestyle and the character of Christ, and then at the aim, the objectives, the mission, which is evangelism, and then helping others follow Christ as well. So it says here, discipleship is all about growing in the knowledge of the teaching, growing in the knowledge of the character, 
the lifestyle of Christ and applying it. And then the aim, the mission. There is a mission. Not just that we grow, but we follow in the mission, the Great Commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the process is best done in the context of relationship, particularly in the local church. So I hope this is clear with you. To grow in the teachings, meaning the New Testament theology, the New Testament doctrines, the teachings of Christ. That is the reason why we had last previous series entitled Discovering Christ in the Gospels. The life, the teachings, and the mission of Christ. Now, the book of Acts are a group of people who grew and lived in the teachings, in the life, and the aim or the mission of Christ. That's why they actually connect, especially, you know what, with one author named Luke, the book of Luke, and the book of Acts. This is, this is Jesus, and this is the effect of Jesus on those who believed in Him and followed Him. And that should be the same to us in our generation. Are we part of this? Are we in it? Are we passionate about it? Are we envisioning things like this? Are we praying, Lord, I pray that I'll be able to start a Bible study here at work. I pray that I would be able to help those that I lead to you become Christ followers. I hope that they can actually be with me in the mission of winning the whole company to you. That is how it looked like or looks like if you are involved. You breathe it. You inhale it. You exhale it. You come out of your bedroom prayed up about it. You go through the day looking for opportunities and you come back and say, Lord, I, I, I missed that opportunity. Can you help me tomorrow? You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be an apostle. All that you have to be is that you are truly a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. Because if you're a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, this is what he said to you and me. Come follow me and I'll send you to fish for people. That's what he said. I didn't say it. <laughs> it's him. Second, discipleship perpetuates the mission of Christ to every generation till His return. Perpetuate simply means continues it or brings it to the next generation. And you might be saying, well, why do we have a responsibility to bring it to the next generation? Because again, just like what I said in Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20, Lo and behold, I will be with you at the very end of the age. Meaning, Jesus is looking forward that the gospel and making disciples, discipleship is happening to the very end of the age. From the first century to the 21st century, or if the end is in the 22nd century, that we as the church are still making disciples. That we're still preaching the gospel. We're still evangelizing. We're still helping those who have been discipled or those who have been saved or led to Christ to grow in their following of Jesus and grow in their being sent by Jesus. That is the reason why on, on, on April 17, from graves, graves into gardens is our theme, a special Sunday, an Easter celebration or Resurrection Sunday, is that we have given you this invitation card in this booklet called Peace to You, so that you can invite unchurched, non-Christian friends that hopefully, as we pray for them, that God will open their hearts and respond and say, I would like to go visit IWC or even watch online. This is not just me going door to door by myself or together with some other pastors hoping that I will reach all of the homes and household of Winnipeg in two weeks' time. <laughs> so I cannot prepare for my preaching mail so you can probably preach next week because me and Pastor Bo and all the other pastors will knock on doors and give this but you know what life will be easier for us if all of you grab a hold of 10 and give this to 10 friends and relatives isn't that amazing that multiplies the work because we are all supposed to be part of the great commission and it perpetuates. The discipleship perpetuates because we bring it to the next person and the next person and to the next generation after next generation till Jesus comes. It is actually to the very end of the age. As Christ followers, we should all be part of making disciples. Paul's compelling cause should also be ours today because during Paul's time, there's no such thing as, oh, 
that's the cause of an apostle, but not to a deacon named Philip or Stephen. And you might be saying, well, a deacon, that's, that's a high position. No, they were just taking care of the widows, providing them the food and serving them the food. And yet, you can see in the story of Stephen and Philip, Philip, even, in fact, was even called Philip the Evangelist, not just Philip the deacon. And he preached the gospel with signs and wonders following. And Stephen was the first martyr. Because after he served the widows, he went out and looked for people to share the gospel with. And he got into trouble, and therefore he was stoned to death. What a glorious stoning to death, though, because he didn't feel the pain. He felt the glory because God opened the, 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 the portal of heaven, and he saw Jesus by the right hand of the Father. It was a painless death. Isn't that amazing? Stoned to death, and yet he didn't, I believe, did not feel the pain because the glory kept him from feeling that pain. That's why in the Fox's Book of Martyrs, you know, the testimony of those who saw the martyrs dying, especially those who were being burned or those who were being crucified, they were singing hymns. Singing praises to God. A testament to the reality of the presence of the master they serve faithfully. In conclusion, I will ask you four questions, and I hope that you can cooperate and respond and be and be participative. Because you know what? A preaching has no power unless it is being applied. So let's go through it one by one, and I'll give you some moment to respond to it. Are you now convinced that you should be part of the call? to make disciples or the great commission. Are you now convinced it's not the great suggestion? Number two, what steps or what stops you from making disciples or being involved in that process? I'm growing, I'm helping others grow. I'm a growing disciple, I'm also praying and trying to reach out to those who do not know the Lord yet. So what steps can you take this week to help you overcome this? May I suggest you can probably get some of these? May I suggest that you can probably join us in our prayer meeting on Wednesday because we're praying for people. And you can invite people and say, hey, we have a prayer meeting on Wednesday and we're just simply, we want to serve the community and we would like to pray for those who need prayers. Anything. You don't have to write your name. It can just be your first name. Like say, I'm Jake and I need prayer of healing because I'm sick with cancer. You, know, you can share this to your friend. And so, you know what? You can just connect with us online I'll give you the link and if you have a prayer request in fact if you have it now I'll send it I'll don't, I won't give you I won't give that our church your last name it's your first name but we would like to serve you because we would like to pray for you serve you by praying for you you can probably do that the Wednesday 6.30 in the evening okay and, and any other means and ways that you can be part of, like start a cell group or probably join a cell group or probably keep attending the cell group or probably you have not attended the cell group for two years. It's time to come out of your hibernation, be part of a life group. Online or in person, sign up, email, chat with us and we will help you. Number three, which of these three areas of discipleship, follow Jesus, fish for people and help others follow Jesus, do you feel you need to grow more in? Some of you may be like, oh, you know, my weakness is evangelism. What is one thing you can do this week to grow in that area? Oh, my weakness is caring for Christians. You know, it's hard. You know, somebody said fellowship is really, community is messy. <laughs> this discipleship pastor from a church in the state said, he wrote, she wrote the book, Discipleship, Community, Fellowship, all of this is messy. Hey, parenting is messy as well. Wipe, wipe, bum, bum. After some time, you don't just wipe, bum, bum. You wipe stubbornness too. You deal with hormonal changes of a teenager. We, we parents, we go through that. We went through that. But hey, it's fulfilling because we love our kids. We love our kids from the moon back. For me, from the sun back. Sunburn now. I love my children. They're to die for, care for, live for, everything. Because I love my children. And you know, we will do everything for our children even though it's messy. Hello? 
So now I'm an expert. I, I believe in wiping bum bums. I can do it with my grandchildren. You know, uncles and aunts, they still have a hard time doing bum bum thingy. But for grandparents, oh, let me do it. It's my turn. <laughs> right? Yeah, community is messy. Discipleship is messy. Fellowship is messy. But hey, get involved. Because, you, you know, God can transform somebody's mess into a message. And they can also help you in transforming your mess into becoming a message. Hello? We're all messy. But by God's grace, we can all be messages. We can all be testimonies. Because we have helped, support, blessed, prayed for, be patient with one another. You know, there's hundreds of one another stuff in the New Testament. So start probably by joining a cell group. Come back. Come back to life groups. Okay, less Korea telenovela. Less K-drama. Less Netflix. Let's, let's come back to life groups. I'm talking to you now. Even come back to the service. There's still some seats here for you. Hello, even if you have kids. We welcome kids here. Hello, it's okay. It's time to come back in in-person service. It's time to come back to life groups. Do something about being part of a life group. It's part of the Great Commission. And last but not the least, how can you help others begin their walk with God? Evangelism. And you might be saying, I don't know. Well, start with prayer. Start with servant evangelism. Serve your neighbors. Just do something. It's expressing that love. I'll give you some time, okay? I just need to drink water. Why don't you process this for a moment and then I'll come back to you. Thank you, uh, Don Fermel Moen. God. I hope you have some ideas right now, some thoughts. I hope you hear the whisper of God's word to begin with in this process, in this journey. I would like to conclude here a scripture found in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58. If you want to know the definition of the gospel, read the whole 1 Corinthians 15. You will find it there. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. At the end of that chapter, this is what Paul exhorted the church. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. This is not the work of getting saved. This is the work of the saved. It is not, I need to work to be saved. No, this is the work of those already saved. Believers in the gospel. Followers of Jesus Christ. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not, not, not in vain. I'll give you two things. Number one, why is it not in vain? Because change lives, you know what? On earth that you see is priceless. I have led some people to Christ, see them continue in their faith. That was, that, that was priceless. Honestly, priceless. You cannot put a money value to it. See marriages transform? See lives change? Not just that they got saved, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, all the religious stuff to begin with, you see the transformative power of the good news and the presence of Jesus. That's on earth. It's not in vain. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The good news is the power of God unto the saving of sinners condemned to hell. And then, in eternity, you get the reward, two kinds of rewards. Number one, you see the person in heaven with you. And you see the rewards or experience the rewards that God has prepared for you. You're not just saved, you have rewards. We vary in rewards in heaven. And there's still, there's going to be some regrets. Why? Because you missed that opportunity. You missed. Oh. My neighbor is not here. Oh, because I didn't pray. I didn't do anything. I just kept my mouth shut. I didn't... Oh, you know, my mother-in-law is not here. 
My children, they're not here. My cousin, my siblings, they're not here. Because I didn't do enough. If you have done so much, then you know what? You would go up there. God, I did it. And God said, yeah, I know. It's about them responding as well. It's not just about you doing your part. But if we have not done anything, then, then remorse and regret will be still experienced to begin with up there. Because we missed. We missed them. And we miss the rewards of doing our part, whether they respond or not. You got that? Because if they did not respond, but you did your part, then there's going to be rewards. I believe that. Are you with me? You know, Christianity is not about being served by God. Christianity is us serving God. That's what Christianity is. Jesus doesn't just save lost people from eternal damnation, but saves people from purposelessness. He gives not just eternal salvation, He gives an eternal compelling cause. Something worth living for, something worth dying for. And thank God for the Apostle Paul. <laughs> we got a good benchmark. We got an example to follow in evangelism, in helping others follow Jesus, in making disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you want to join? You want to be part of this amazing mission, this amazing life, this amazing purpose, something to live for and even die for. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit is here speaking to you right now. And if you just simply say yes, the Holy Spirit will show you the path and empower you to fulfill your God-given destiny in relation to the Great Commission. Amen. Before we partake of the communion, if that's you, and say, say, yes, Lord, here am I. Yes, Lord, start with the baby step. I'm willing, Lord. I don't know how. I'm, 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 I'm an introvert, but God, I'm willing. I say yes to you the second time around. Not just getting saved, but to serve you, to work with you, to work for you. Amen. If that's you, I would like to stand up before we partake of the communion. Say, yes, Lord, here am I. Yes, Lord, I say yes to you. This is my first step. This is my initial response. There you go. And I would like you to prepare for communion. You know, one of the messages, the great messages of communion is this. We are part of one body. My hand cares for my body. My mouth cares for my body. Imagine if my mouth would not respond to the feeding. Hello? <laughs> I'm not talking about the phone, but about my... <laughs> Imagine if my mouth would say, I don't want to eat. Mm. <laughs> you know? Like, what's going to happen to the whole body? Right? It's going to suffer. And so we are part of one body. We are part of one body of Christ. And we as a body, we have a responsibility to take care of the body and we're also, we have the responsibility to help others, to be kind to others, to bring them to the body. Amen? And so that's our covenant with Him. Yes, we're saved, but now we also have the covenant to take care of the body of Jesus and to serve together with the body of Jesus, the world that is still needed to be brought to, into fellowship with Christ. And so before we partake of the communion, let's say, yes, yes, Lord. I want to be... a contributing part of the body, the body's health and the mission of the body. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for giving your life for us. Thank you, Lord, that you found us worthy of your life and your death, of your suffering. We're so eternally grateful. And we thank you as well that you saved us not just from sin and eternal damnation. You saved us from purposelessness. You've given us a compelling cause. You've given us the Great Commission. Something worth living for. And today we say, yes, sign me up and help me take the baby steps or whatever steps you have in mind to begin with and all the way to our destination. Guide me and empower me to be faithful and be committed to the work of the Lord, which I believe greatly involves the Great Commission. Thank you, God. This is our prayer. Thank you. Thank you for your body and your blood, the symbols of your body and your blood. 
This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's eat the bread together. And let's drink from the cup together after eating the bread. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. May the Lord guide you and bless you and keep you and use you to represent Christ well and make a difference in the lives of the people around you. All the way to the very end, rejoicing in eternity with Jesus in our friends and families. In Jesus' name, and everybody say, Amen and Amen. God bless. Have a good day. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Kahapon pa yun. That was yesterday. <laughs>